Hello and welcome to this Energy Conversations event convened by the ANU Institute for Climate, Energy and Disaster Solutions, or ICEDS as we call it, uh, in collaboration with the Australian Institute of Energy. Uh, we acknowledge the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and we pay our respect to their elders past and present. Uh, and here in Canberra, of course, that is the Nunaval people. My name is Frank Yotso. I am the head of energy at the ANU Institute of Climate, Energy and Disaster Solutions. Um, ICED's role is to connect uh, ANU with the world on climate energy and disaster risk uh, with related research um, and, and to help advance uh, integration and, and innovation across disciplines. Um, now, the Energy Conversation Series has become uh, something of an institution actually since it started uh, six years ago now. Um, and today's Energy Conversation um, is on consumer ability to manage electricity demand. Uh, our speaker is Dr. Lee White, here from the ANU, from the Grand Challenge Zero Carbon in Asia Pacific program. Uh, Lee will report uh, the findings from a project that was supported, financially supported by the Actua AGL Icon Water Endowment Fund. Uh, and this is a wonderful resource actually for us here at ANU that allows topical, uh, locally relevant research on water and energy topics to be done. And as always in the energy conversations, we have an absolutely stellar panel uh, to provide additional uh, perspectives, insights, and to, to motivate uh, the conversational uh, part uh, of, the, uh, of the event. Uh, our moderator will introduce the speakers, uh, the speaker and, and the panelists. Um, and uh, just from me to say, um, we very warmly uh, invite you to actively take part uh, in that conversation in the last half hour of the of the event, uh, when you're also uh, really uh, invited to uh, to take part and and discuss. Now, our moderator uh, today, um, we're very happy to have Steve Bloom uh, in that important role. Steve is a highly experienced energy expert and advocate with. Uh, going on 20 years experience in the energy sector. Steve Bloom is president of the Australian Smart Energy Council uh, and holds uh, various roles with uh, other organizations, including the Global Solar Council, the New Zealand Pacific Solar and Storage Council, and the Australian Institute uh, of uh, Energy, the Asia Pacific PV Industry Association. And Steve, you can tell us if we've left anything out. Um, Steve used to be a former, used to be a political advisor as well as a private and public sector senior executive. Uh, and in fact, uh, I, I remember first working with um, uh, Steve Bloom when he was advisor in then Minister Simon Cobell's office. So today uh, we will hear Lee White's talk, then have the contributions from the panel, and then uh, it's an open Q&A uh, with the speaker uh, and, and the panel and you all. So thank you very much for joining us uh, and over to you, Steve. Thank you very much, Frank, and hello, everyone. Um, Frank's uh, introduced me and I would probably know quite a few people on the call. It's my pleasure to um, moderate this afternoon and I, I really think we're going to have an exciting uh, presentation because I. I know the subject matter and it's it's really, really interesting and the findings interesting as well. We have an exciting and excellent lineup of presenters and panelists um, who we'll be hearing from shortly. Um, on the panel tonight, we have Michael Ambrose, Lahiru Haparuchtichi, Jean McGlynn, Dr. Ralph Steinhauser, and Daria Tiorovic. Unfortunately, Dr. Amara Aisbert, who was going to be with us, was unable to join us because she's not very well. Just a little bit of um, housekeeping and some admin notes. Um, audience members can submit questions at any time in the Q&A box, and you can find it that at the bottom of your Zoom window. You can also vote for other people's questions by clicking on the thumbs up beside them. And in discussion after the presentation, after the presentation, I will put as many of the questions as we have time for in the panel and try to um, prioritise those which have the most votes. For the benefits of those who can't join us live tonight, the event is being recorded. If you don't want to be recorded, you'll need to indicate um, and leave the recording, leave the session, unfortunately. Um, and we will be recording, uh, those people registered will have access to later. So to give an opening statement on this uh, this afternoon, we're joined by Jessica Lees. Jessica is the lead joint venture strategy at ACTU AGL and has been working closely with the chief executive officer and executive team. She's responsible for coordinating the development and delivery of organizational strategy. As part of this role, Jess has overseen the Actua 
AGL Icon Water ANU Endowment Fund that Frank referred to earlier and has been most valuable for um, the ANU and the community generally because of the products that come out of the work done under that. Over to you, Jess. Thanks, Steve, for that introduction. I'm really pleased to be here today uh, on behalf of the Actuate GL Icon Water Endowment Fund. Our partnership with ANU is a really exciting one um, and rewarding for all. For more than a decade, the partnership has funded research exploring that intersection between academia and industry with the intent to gather and provide some really valuable energy and water insights um, for our broader community. So far, we've had 18 research projects funded, all producing really thought-provoking insights and findings for many stakeholders. The presentation you're gonna to hear today from Dr. White is a combination of, of hard work, collaboration and passion. And it really explores the themes that align with our commitment at ActuAGL to providing responsible um, and en innovative energy solutions for the capital region. Insights from this research will be really key in informing our future strategy and we're pleased to have been an active part of Dr White's research. We also look forward to all the future projects um, that can come about as part of the fund. Thanks and, and back to you. Thanks Jess. It's my great pleasure to um, introduce our main presenter tonight, Dr Lee White. Lee is a research fellow with the Zero Carbon Energy for the Asia Pacific Grand Challenge Program. Absolutely exciting program at the ANU, contributing greatly to the knowledge about um, what we need to do for COP26 and beyond. Lee has published in areas including drivers of residential solar ad adoption, predictions, predictive the intent to adopt electric vehicles, and household response to demand management rates to ship timing and electricity use. Her research relates to understanding how systems can be changed to increase clean energy technology adoption, including understanding policy needs to support a just energy transition. Over to you, Jess. Was that possibly? Okay. No, it was over to you, Lee. Okay, uh -huh. thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Take it away. We've got a Jessica Lees and a Lee White. So uh, <laughs> my, my apologies for that. Yes. Um, uh, so good afternoon everyone um, and, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Lee White at the ANU. Um, I would, I'm just sharing that presentation now. Um, but I would also like to begin by um, acknowledging the traditional owners of the unceded lands on which we meet today and extending my respects to elders past and present. Um, I'm here on Ngunnawal and Nambri country um, and I know many of you are joining us from around the country and around the world so uh, welcome. This is research that I'm presenting um, conducted with my team, Dr. Emma Aisbed and Krista Shen. Um, and we were very glad to have that funding from the ICON Water and ACTU AGL Endowment Grant. We wouldn't have been able to conduct the research without it. And we're also very grateful to Lahiru for his support throughout the project and his role at ACTU AGL. Um, he's been very generous with his time in answering many questions that arose uh, as we worked through the data um, and in getting us uh, the data. Uh, that we used in the first place. Um, and so the motivation for this project was really looking at energy transition um, and how as electricity systems need to change in the future to better uh, integrate variable, variable generation such as solar and wind, um, there will need to be a large suite of tools that we introduce to uh, help the electricity systems work with that. Um, since you can't necessarily dispatch your solar and wind to make sure that your supply occurs at the um, moment when your demand uh, arises. There's also a need for tools like batteries, but also uh, demand management where you uh, influence through various mechanisms when the demand for that electricity occurs. Demand management tends to rely on changes in behavior. So here I'm looking at residential behavior, so household behavior, such as when the heater is turned on and how high it is, um, or things like when you put the laundry on. Um, and these behavior changes and the impact that they have on energy use and timing um, are very likely shaped by the uh, building energy efficiency um, of the dwellings that these households are in. So what we really wanted to understand with this project uh, was how building energy efficiency shapes these household responses to time varying rates that are used for demand management. 
We looked at one of the most common types of time varying rates, which is known as a time of use rate. Uh, people in the ACT may be familiar with these as we've got them here. Um, in these rates, you pay more for electricity uh, you know, on a cents per kilowatt hour basis when you use electricity during defined peak times. Um, there are other types of time varying rates that may be more common as the energy transition continues um, that are more dynamic, uh, but at the moment time of use rates are the most widespread. Um, and in looking at these, we hope to get some insights also about what other types of demand management might uh, impact in the future. Um, but some previous research that I conducted with US sample indicated that some socio-demographic groups end up facing a disproportionately worse health and cost outcomes on these time of use rates. In particular, we found that the elderly and those with disabilities um, faced a disproportionate bill increases on time of use rates. So for that sample, everyone's bills went up, but those who were elderly or had a disability saw an even greater increase um, than their counterparts. We also saw that there were some impacts in that prior work on uh, ethnic minorities having worse health outcomes and low income households experiencing more thermal discomfort. This gave rise to the current research. Um, what we really wanted to understand was the role that energy efficiency could potentially be playing in uh, these findings that we saw. So we know from prior research that low income households and also racial and ethnic minorities are much more likely to live in housing that isn't energy efficient. Um, and these differing energy efficiencies in uh, buildings could be part of what underlies differences that we saw in that other work uh, in the cost and health impacts that different groups faced on time of use rates. For a more local example, um, some prior work has found that in Australia, uh, households experienced a wide range of impacts when they were responding to peak pricing events, uh, which send, um, typically send a message that you, know, you need to reduce your electricity during a particular set of hours uh, as the grid has become quite congested. Um, and the household responses to that sort of range to they didn't really notice any discomfort at all when they turned their AC off, um, all the way to, you know, that it became so uncomfortable that they had to leave the house for a different location, um, or they decided to turn it back on and just deal with the cost consequences. Um, this could potentially be related uh, to the building envelope's ability to retain heat. So if you have uh, an energy inefficient house that isn't well insulated, um, the, when you turn the heater off or when you turn the AC off, it's going to lose that uh, comfortable temperature much more quickly. Um, so in a more inefficient house, you have to continually add electricity or energy um, to maintain that temperature uh, at something that's different from outdoors, whereas one that's better insulated will hold it for a bit longer, even if you're not continually putting that energy in. And this is particularly relevant for time varying electricity rates um, because preheating and pre-cooling are some of the strategies that typically get recommended as a way to shift your use to the off-peak times that are cheaper um, without experiencing too much discomfort. So if you want to heat your house right before that peak rate, um, this is for the ACT schedule here, if you wanted to have your heater on from 4 to 5 and then turn it off, um, it might get quite cold by 8 p.m. if your house uh, doesn't retain the heat very well. Um, so really from this, uh, we saw that there was a need to understand whether the energy efficiency of homes was playing a role in residential ability to manage their costs when they were on uh, these time varying electricity rates. Uh, we know that from prior research that there's probably um, you know, that, that housing efficiency will limit the ability to shift or curtail uh, heating and cooling. Uh, but no one has previously looked at this with the example of households actually on these time varying rates. Um, and so ours is the first to do this. And it really wouldn't have been possible without uh, the partnership with ActuA GL um, and also in the ACT because we really had something of a unique opportunity with the ACT's mandated disclosure of energy efficiency ratings um, and also the time of use rates uh, and the partnership with ActuAGL to understand um, how usage changed. So we examined a sample of, one of a little over 1,000 residents in the ACT uh, with data on their uh, electricity use for up to five years. Um, we began with a much larger sample, um, potential sample, um, but throughout data cleaning, um, this is the final number we ended up with. 
the, the data on electricity use and several other areas was provided by ACTU AGL, and we got the energy efficiency ratings from Domain, um, one of the real estate companies. Uh, we also use sociodemographic data from uh, the Australian Bureau of Statistics. When we were looking at these households, um, we had a set group that was our, our treatment households, those who had switched at some point in those five years for which we had data, um, households that had switched between a flat rate and a time of use rate. Uh, we wanted to select a control group of households who had remained on flat rates throughout that time period. And we wanted them to be as similar as possible to the treatment households. Uh, so we used a technique known as course and exact matching um, to select a control group that was uh, similar across a range of the socio-demographic characteristics. Um, when we coded the energy efficiency ratings, we went with a, a simple binary split where a household was considered high EER to have a high energy efficiency rating if it was five or above, um, or and it, correspondingly, it was low EER if it was below five. Um, So in the course and exact, oops, in the course and exact matching, um, we controlled for incomes, the median of the SA1, um, because we didn't have the sociodemographic data at that individual household level. This was then looking at the SA1 from the ABS, where there's 200 to 800 people in an area. Um, we also looked at the number of occupants, the, level, the median years of education, whether a household was owning or renting, which we did have at the individual level, uh, as well as the number of bedrooms. Again, we had that one at the individual level. Um, whether they had never had solar, had installed solar sometime over the five years, or had had solar the whole time, um, whether they had a gas connection, and whether that had enough seasonal variation that it appeared to be used for heating. Um, and we also uh, compared them across that EER there. So in selecting this course, and um, exact matching technique, the idea is that we control for as many things as possible um, in selecting that control group uh, so that the results aren't driven overly um, by these sociodemographic characteristics that we've controlled for. Uh, we used a technique called two-way fixed effects to examine whether this uh, switching between a time of use and a flat rate had a different effect um, as a function of energy efficiency rating. And so our model accounted in this fixed effects um, approach. Uh, it, it controls for uh, time varying characteristics that are the same for all households, such as um, that there's a unit time, there's a unit fixed term and a, a time fixed term. And the time fixed term means that uh, if there was you know, a particularly cold quarter that all households experience the same, um, that's not driving the results uh, because it's controlled for. And likewise, if there was something about a household that stayed the same over the entire period, um, that's, that's controlled for it too. Uh, the chem, the course and exact matching is, uh, again, removing that potential bias based on any of the observable time invariant characteristics like sociodemographic status um, that I discussed before. Uh, and we also added controls to the model for uh, things that we could see had varied over time, such as whether they'd installed solar, how much solar is being exported to the grid, um, their gas consumption for the quarter, um, and whether they had both solar uh, and a time of use rate at the same time. We looked at our full sample, which is that uh, 1,221 households that I was discussing earlier. Um, we also looked at just households that didn't have any gas connection and at just households that didn't have any solar. Uh, so we expected that there would be the biggest differences in the household without gas because they must be using electric heating. Um, whereas the no solar sample was the one that would be the most robust means of making sure that solar uh, wasn't influencing anything um, in a way that we couldn't see what was happening there. Um, because often when a household switches to solar that can uh, install solar, that can be a prompt to get a time of use rate at that point. Um, and there might be a lot of different things going on there. Uh, so we included it as a control. Uh, what we found was, contrary to expectations, um, it was the high EER households, those higher energy efficiency ones, uh, that saw higher bills when they were on time of use rates. Um, whereas the low EER households, uh, that full sample in that sample that didn't have any solar, uh, we didn't really see any difference 
for those households um, associated with which of the rates they were on, whether they were on flat or time of use rates. Uh, but for the ones that didn't have gas, that one that we thought we would see the biggest differences, um, they actually appeared to see a decrease um, to see lower bills when they were on time of use rates. Um, it was significant within 90% confidence intervals, but not within 95% confidence intervals. So it's a little bit borderline um, whether we can put too much confidence in that. Likewise, in the usage results, um, the directions again, it was the high EER households that saw a, a quite robust increase in use when they were on time of use rates, um, whereas the low energy efficiency households um, actually appeared to have lower use when they were on time of use rates, um, with the exception actually of the ones that didn't have gas, uh, which did not have a significant difference in usage depending on which of those rates they were on. Um, and so, uh, we expected that the low EER households would be the ones um, that had more trouble adjusting to the time of use rates, but it appears that the, uh, the high EER households were the ones um, that were using more and seeing higher bills. Uh, we also ran some robustness checks on this, um, got quite a large number of them. Uh, it wasn't a randomized control tri trial. Um, people, so there was a possibility that people you know, had chosen to go on time of use rates because they thought it would be better for them. Uh, prior work has indicated that households, you know, they generally prefer to be on time of use if they think it will be better for them. Um, but in previous work, uh, households haven't been very good at judging um, whether they actually are financially benefiting from time of use. So they'll say, yeah, I'll switch to it because, um, you know, I think it'll be cheaper, um, but it actually won't be cheaper when you, when you look at their bills differences. Um, and so we ran some additional models with legs and leads to assess trends over time. So um, to try to see uh, if we could determine whether the change was something that was caused by switching to a different rate um, or whether if it was part of another uh, existing trend um, that happened to coincide with uh, switching rates. Um, these robustness checks indicated that the usage changes we saw for the high EER households, they were caused by a change of rates. Um, the trends over time were stable until the rate change occurred. Um, but for the low EER households, they already had trends in changing usage um, before they did uh, change rates. So switching rates um, appears for those low EER households to have been just one of many things um, that they were doing to try to reduce uh, perhaps their use in their overall electricity costs. So we did find that um, the energy efficiency of the house was associated with different experiences um, for electricity bills and electricity usage on uh, these different rate times, time varying rate types, the time varying versus flat. Um, but the difference wasn't uh, the difference that we expected to see. So what we didn't see was those low energy efficiency households appearing to face financial disadvantage when they were on these time of use rates. Um, we had expected that they would face that disadvantage because, as I described at the start, um, a low energy efficiency house isn't uh, able to make use of strategies such as preheating, um, and the house will become uncomfortable much more rapidly uh, if the heat or cool is turned off. Um, so, but we did see in our robustness checks that these households are particularly likely, it seems, to be actively seeking ways to reduce their electricity bills. Um, so moving to a time of use rate might be part of that. So it wouldn't necessarily be that the time of use rate caused them to change their use, um, but that something else was driving both uh, the switch and the usage reduction. Um, however, these households didn't consistently see lower bills when they were on time of use rates. It was only those households without gas that we saw that for. Um, and that was, uh, it, it was um, not, at the level of significance for 95% confidence intervals. Um, we think that these households without gas um, that are low energy efficiency, um, since they have standalone heating appliances, they may be able to better estimate how much energy they're consuming and have a better understanding of when that energy use is occurring. So although the heating appliances will likely be less energy efficient um, and the heating will be more expensive, 
um, they're less likely to just turn the heating on and leave it and forget, for example, that uh, 5 p.m. peak time rates have started. Um, and they're more likely to have, for example, written information regarding how many watts the appliance is using when it is turned on. Um, and standalone heating options are also more of a visual reminder of energy consumption. Um, so those are all things that some prior research has found um, can help correct household misperceptions of home energy use. Um, and that if there is sort of that written information and visual reminder, people are more easily able to sort of estimate, okay, this is what's using the energy at this time in my house. Um, the, high e the high EER households be expected would be able to make bill savings on the time of use rates because they should, um, they should have the capacity to uh, shift their heating and cooling load without experiencing as much discomfort, um, which could have given them um, an advantage at uh, optimizing their time use um, of electricity to when the cheaper rates for time of use rates occur. Um, we found the opposite, that these were the households that tended to face higher bills when they were on time of use, um, and also that they were increasing total consumption when they were on time of use rates. Um, and so this may be uh, some level of underestimating um, the, the, the ideal balance of, of how much to use on the off-peak times versus the on-peak times. Um, and the increase in consumption may be from things like, well, since it's now off-peak rates, uh, we'll run the dishwasher overnight even though it's not quite full so that we don't end up running it during a peak or a shoulder time um, when it does fill up, say, in the morning. Um, likewise, it might be things like running heaters a little bit warmer overnight during, during those off-peak times. Um, but again, adding up to a larger total energy consumption with that behavior. Um, so the tendency of these households towards higher bills when they're on time of use rates suggests that they're not able to fully optimize the timing of their electricity consumption, um, despite you know, having buildings that should support that a little bit better. Um, it could be due either to lack of information on how much energy each appliance is using, uh, or it could be a convenience issue that it's just not worth uh, the inconvenience of, of, of changing behavior um, to save what's probably a, a fairly small amount. And so really our recommendations um, for this are that uh, if there's, a, so these are based on prior research, um, that more frequent feedback on energy use tends to help households with effective load shifting. So from our findings, we saw that probably the households that had sort of better energy consciousness were better able to make use of those time varying rates. Uh, billing in the ACT generally only occurs quarterly. Um, and, and prior work has found that when customers receive bills even every one or two months instead of more frequently, um, the time of use rates become less influential in that situation. So three months is quite long compared to that. Um, and, and there's quite a wide body of behavioral uh, research that's found that feedback on energy use um, tends to be most effective when it's given frequently and when it's easy to identify which appliance is using the energy. Uh, one other thing that we did think um, based on that, those results from the high EER households is that there could be some benefits uh, to training installers and service personnel when they're putting in, say, an upgrade to a heating system to make it more energy efficient, um, that they could at that time uh, program it so that it is turning on and off uh, in accordance with when the peak times and off peak times are. Um, there's also been prior research that it found that people tended to not use uh, timer settings on their, uh, on their thermostats, on their heating devices, even if they had the capacity to do that, uh, simply because they're, they tend to be very inconvenient um, to program. And one thing that our research in the end, um, we were not able to fully understand what the comfort impacts might have been on those low EER households that appeared to have that trend of decreasing energy use. Um, that's something that we would really need to do follow-up work to understand or other people would need to do follow-up work to understand um, what those comfort impacts are of uh, and, and perhaps other uh, impacts such as stress from having to just have, be that much more conscious of when the energy is being used um, to avoid the cost penalties. Um, 
And with that, I think uh, I can hand it back to Steve to open up for the discussion. I think I may have been quite concise there, Steve. So you've done, you've done very well. You've been just almost exactly to time, which is a very unusual um, result in one of most of these things. Um, thank you very much, Lee. Very insightful. And um, there, we've got a bunch of questions. But I'll uh, welcome all our panellists and just give a more detailed introduction so that people know who we're talking to and with. Um, I gave their names before, but I'll give a, a, a brief introduction to them. Uh, Michael Ambrose is a senior experimental scientist in CSIRO's Energy Business Unit. He leads projects for industry and the Australian government involving residential building energy efficiency. Uh, Lahiru Hapiruchichi is the lead product and innovation engineer at Actuagile Retail, responsible for leading projects in emerging technologies and distributed energy innovation. Jean McGlynn is the executive group manager of the Climate Change Energy Division, energy division in the ACT government. Dr. Rafe Steinhauser, Stein, Steinhauser is a senior research fellow at the Policy Experiments Lab, the Centre for Social Research and Methods, Research School of Social Sciences, and a member of the Tax and Transfer Policy Institute at the Crawford School of Public Policy. And Daria Tiaradovich is the sales and project manager at Laros Technologies, the leading national buildings material supplier and consultant for passive house construction in Australia. Welcome to you all. I might start with Michael. Um, just what are your thoughts on Lee's presentation? I'll just unmute myself. Um, well, firstly, uh, thanks very much, Lee. That was a really, um, really interesting uh, talk. So thanks, thanks very much. And look, this whole area of uh, human behaviour uh, in in our homes is is a fascinating one, and it's one that I uh, I'm always interested to see uh, research on. And look, generally speaking, I agree. Uh, you know, we, we have seen similar things in, uh, we do, I do a lot of work in the uh, energy efficiency uh, space of buildings, and we've seen similar uh, things in, in higher rated homes uh, related to, to window opening schedules uh, in, in homes where people say they're going to do one thing, they, they do the right things, they put these, these systems in place, and then don't actually follow through on the behaviour side. So I think a lot of the things that you uh, speculated at why they, these higher uh, rated homes are actually increased their, their energy uh, consumption is, is probably due to, to a misunderstanding uh, about how these homes uh, actually operate and particularly how their systems operate. And often these homes will have much larger systems in them. So they'll have ducted, ducted systems for, versus uh, standalone systems. So they do use uh, more energy. And that convenience factor of, oh, I think we're doing the right thing. We've moved to a tariff that we think is cheaper and we're just going to keep pressing the button and turning our systems on, even though it might, might actually be occurring uh, in, in, a, in a peak time is, is something that, uh, that I'm not surprised at and, um, and we have seen elsewhere. And it does lead to this whole uh, idea of do we actually need uh, to have smarter homes <laughs> that, 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 that take the humans uh, out, of, out of the picture uh, and actually have better control systems uh, uh, in there and that can manage these homes, particularly as we're getting more and more efficient homes and more and more complex systems. You know, you're, you're quite right that the, the complexity that goes around trying to program uh, these heating systems sometimes can actually be, uh, be complicated. I've got one in my house. I still haven't worked out how to how to how to program it. So I think having these smart systems in place, having a system that actually takes the control away from us and hands it over to uh, to a system that looks after it for us is is a much better way uh, of doing it. And probably how we're going to see homes uh, in in the future are, are going to be much more uh, in, in that type of mould. Uh, thank you, Michael. Lahiru, would you like to just have a brief comment on Lee's presentation? Uh, Thank you, Steve. Yeah, uh, it's been great working with Lee on, the, on this project. Um, so Actuagile as a retailer, we are very interested in uh, understanding consumer behavior and how we can uh, help our customers uh, use the energy. Um, this research has prioritized some great insight into that uh, uh, behavior and we will be hosting that information to uh, deploy our um, energy efficiency programs and our uh, energy plants as well. Thank you, Lahiru. That's great. Um, 
I'm sure it's going to be valuable for almost everybody on the panel and the call as well as number of users. I thought I found it fascinating. Um, Jean, what about you? Have you got a few thoughts on the presentation? Yeah, thanks very much, Steve. And thanks to the ICEDS, um, which is just a great resource for Australia and the ACT. Um, and thanks to Lee for the study, which is great. And I really like it for a lot of reasons, but it addresses behavioral economics as opposed to economic theory, which is great. Um, and it also, I think, recognizes that different households behave different ways, and we need to think about that as we develop policy. So it's really good. Um, when, I, when I first heard of the results, I have tried to figure out in my head what, what I think might be at work here, and um, you've identified some. I guess I was thinking through the issue of um, why we think different EERs would lead to different um, outcomes. When I look through the different uses of energy in the house, the heating, cooling, hot water, plug load, lighting, that's what households um, use their energy for. EERs really only affect the heating and cooling. Um, and so that's where the difference comes. And heating and cooling tends to be the one of the areas that I think has less variability in that people want their house to be hot and cold when they want it to be hot and cold. There's a little bit of um, stuff they can vary, but um, they can't shift it completely in time. And also when they're on high ER ratings, even though the price may be more expensive for peak times, the cost could be quite a bit lower because they're, they're using less energy naturally. So I'm not sure that's an irrational response. Lighting doesn't have much adjustment. And so I think maybe it'd be interesting to look more at what's happening with the hot water and the plug load, which are the areas where I think people can actively shift their use uh, more and I think those loads, by first principles, should be a much bigger percentage of energy use um, in low EER households than in high EER households, simply because the energy of heating and cooling should be less. Um, and so I guess I would wonder whether some of that is just a, a recognition of what's happening with the price signals driving the really easily shifted loads as opposed to the ones that are a little bit harder to shift. Um, but uh, you know, I welcome the questions and I'm having further discussion. Thanks, Gene. Ralph, your views, please. Thank you, Steve. And thank you, Lee, for a wonderful presentation. I very much enjoyed that. And uh, I want to congratulate you on really good research here, because uh, particularly that course and the exact matching that you're using in, in combination with the diff and diff uh, approach in the regressions, uh, we give kind of a semi-parametric control type approach to uh, construct the control and the uh, treatment group here um, and makes for very conservative estimates. Um, but in terms of, uh, as far as I understand, I guess you certainly did the best with the data that's available. But just since we have XGAGL on the call, I think uh, there's a, you know, we could probably understand more or do better in terms of uh, the analysis here, I guess, with uh, better data rather than just sort of the billing every three months or maybe a more continuous or more insights that would give us more insight into who has a battery because um, it is very hard to make time of use work for you as a consumer in order to save money if you don't have a battery if you don't have a very big load like an ev or i don't know a pool or something that you would really heat overnight uh, it's going to be really tricky um i think the what lee mentioned the set and forget is potentially a um, big factor I do think that there is other differences between the high uh, uh, EER households and the low EER households, partly because typically older households uh, are lower and more recently built houses have a higher rating and therefore you know, more efficient appliances and potentially also the ability to actually set and forget, which might not be able uh, or might not be typically possible for the older households with the older appliances that don't have even that capability of, in order to do so. Thank you, Ralph. Um, okay. We, we'll come back to you. Sorry, I'm just trying to restrict people to a couple of minutes on each one. Right. Daria, your thoughts, please. Um, look, I suppose I see it as maybe the high EER buildings see a false security inefficiency and because they're higher rated um, they think they can heat and it's negligible input you just run it you're comfortable all is good um, whereas once you know you're in a low energy rated house i think a lot of people accept that it's a futile exercise so why just blast your heating and cooling when you know it's not really going to bring you a whole lot of comfort. And at that point, why waste the resources and your money ultimately? 
Uh, thank you, thank you, Dario, for a nice brief comment. <laughs> That's good. Um, now, look, 